Tonight on Milwaukee Tonight, we pause to recognize Black History Month and invite you to learn about our community's rich history and those who inspire us today. So without accountability, we can't say that we're about change. Where would we be if everybody in the world just said, I give up? Over the next 30 minutes, a tribute to the triumphs and challenges our neighbors are facing and the steps to overcome them. Part of having a good life for an African American is having pride in who you are and, and where you come from. As we elevate diverse voices in celebration of Black History Month here in Milwaukee. And thank you for joining us for this Black History Month special. I'm Steve Shamraz. Tonight, we are coming to you live from Milwaukee's Black Holocaust Museum. Black history covers every inch of this place. And finally, it is opening once again to the public. The grand reopening ceremony is tomorrow morning. We're going to talk about what's here and what you can look forward to seeing when you step inside. But first, let's recognize some Milwaukee trailblazers. Val Phillips, one of the most prominent figures of Milwaukee's African-American community. In 1956, she became the first African-American and first woman elected to Milwaukee's Common Council. She was also at the front lines of the fair housing fight. In the sports world, baseball icon Hank Aaron's major league career started with the Milwaukee Braves. He was known for his record-breaking home runs, but he knocked it out of the park when it came to advancing racial equity. As we mentioned, America's Black Holocaust Museum is opening its doors again tomorrow. It was founded by James Cameron. He was well known for surviving a lynching in Indiana. And tomorrow, his dream will once again be a reality. Let's get back into the reopening and what you at home can expect to see when the doors open to the public tomorrow. This is Dr. Burt Davis. He is the president and the CEO of America's Black Holocaust Museum. How does it feel the night before this opens to the public again. Well, thanks so much for being here, number one. To be very candid and honest with you, I haven't slept very much this entire <laughs> week because of the excitement. I, there, there are two things that I think are really important about our re-emerging and reopening. One is, quite frankly, our founder, Dr. Cameron. When I was asked, because I was here before at the Zoological Society, I'm a veterinarian by training. And so I've worked in zoos and aquariums my entire career. When I was asked to come back, I heard the story, had read the story before of continuing the legacy of Dr. Cameron. And within 30 minutes of getting a couple of calls, I knew I was coming back. It is because of his spirit, because of his work. It's because of the trajectory of his life was changed by surviving a public lynching mm -hmm. that we are most excited about reopening this museum. The second thing is, and I know that my, my good friend here, Reggie Jackson, is going to talk about this as well, is what better time? What time that's most relevant for us to reemerge a museum like this? In a time in which, through legislation, we're trying to prevent people from voting. Mm -hmm. We're trying to keep our history out of classrooms. It's history. It's, it's not our history. It's everyone's history. Tell people the history they can see here, because there is history here, hundreds of years ago history, and there's two years ago on this wall right over here. Right. It's, it's a long story. It is a long story. And so we, we kind of say tongue in cheek, we take about 500 years of our history and we condense it into less than 5,000 square feet. <laughs> so the great thing is that we've already purchased um, a building across the street, so we will will be expanding, right. but we basically start, and we want to provide context, so we start with talking about the continent of Africa being the cradle of civilization, and, and, and making sure that our visitors, especially our students, especially young uh, students of color, don't think that our emergence as Americans was slavery, yeah. our, our enslavement. So we talk about um, the economies that were created, the history of our continent of Africa. And then we talk about significant events throughout the world. Then we move into the transatlantic slave trade, um, Jim Crow, um, the economy of, of why we even had slavery. Sure. And then we get into the civil rights era. One of the things that's really great for us is we have a, a map that has migration patterns uh -huh. that shows where primarily all of the people of color who live in Milwaukee 
either came from Alabama or Mississippi. There's and, something tangible. And we're going to tell some of those stories in the rest of the half hour. So I got to cut our conversation short, but, okay. but we'll pick this up in just a little bit. Thank you so much. And congratulations Thank for you. finally getting this ready to reopen to the public. Now, if change were a person, that person would be Amando Duckworth. And as James Groh is going to show us, he's turned his life around after being released from prison, putting all of his effort into change and accountability. Every day since I've been home, I'm out here every day, no matter the weather, no matter what, I'm out here. <sighs> Even the minor stuff creates change. The Amando Duckworth you see now, the one cleaning his neighborhood of hypodermic needles, and it had something in it too, <laughs> is not the same one you would have met 10 years ago. I was gang banging, selling drugs, robbing, you name it, I was a part of it. This photo was taken of him in Boscobel Prison in southwestern Wisconsin. I ended up getting sentenced to 30 years in prison. Uh, I was convicted of two armed robberies and um, possession of a firearm by felon. He appealed and got out after 12 and a half years. Now he's a new man. When you ask me who I am, I tell people I am change. Since earning his freedom, Amando has dedicated his life to the community. I do youth mentoring, I do um, community cleanups, I feed the homeless. Yep. And he organizes neighborhood cleanups. Yeah. In just about an hour, they filled bag after bag after bag. If I reach one person, that person reaches another. And it just spreads, like the domino effect, like we were talking about earlier. I'm real emotional about change because I just lost my auntie. I have a funeral to go to on Saturday. And she always told me, nephew, you need to change. You need to get right. You need to. And I was so glad when she said, nephew, you doing it. That commitment to change goes beyond just himself. That means if my son is committing crimes, I have to be willing to turn my son in. Which is what he did. Amando turned his son in for stealing a car. How can I say I'm about change if I'm letting my son do the stuff that I'm preaching against? It wasn't easy. That hurt me to my core. But Amando realized that change has to start with him. Because without accountability, we can't say that we're about change. Where would we be if everybody in the world just said, I give up? And that's what keeps me motivated. In Milwaukee, James Grow, TMJ4 News. James Grow, thank you. Uh, many of us put up a tree to celebrate the holidays. At the St. Anne's Center for Intergenerational Care, they put up a tree to celebrate Black History Month. Cassandra McShepard joins us now. Tell us more about that. You know, Steve, people of all ages and backgrounds receive daycare service at the St. Anne Center, so it's important for them to be able to see positive images that look like them. The Black History Month tree does just that. It's good to see a reflection of yourself. This tree was developed because you know, here at St. Anne, we service more than just adults. We have children, and they need to realize that there are every element of life that they can participate in and become successful. And so this came as a dream. Uh, and, and then I started searching and collecting magazines, and so we had our clients and our children and some of the teachers work on cutting out different people that were people of color. There are some very famous people on this tree, mm -hmm. and then there are some people that are just everyday people. Mm -hmm. So you'll see some people that are probably going to be very easily recognizable mm -hmm. as President Obama. Mm -hmm. And then there may be someone that, that it's just a face. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a face of, a, of an actress. It could be a face of somebody that's shampooing a rug. But it was a reflection of every hue of an African-American. The ornaments that are on here are representative of the community stakeholders that we've, in the last three years, had the opportunity of honoring. One of my favorite ones <laughs> is one of our honorees this year, which is Cassandra McShepard. 
You know, Steve, it really is a wonderful way. And it's so important that people see images that look like them that are doing good things. And you made the tree. I made the tree. Cassandra recovered. Thank you so much. <laughs> Coming up, let's talk about overcoming hardships with so much work to be done. How does the civil rights fight continue forward? We'll have that conversation coming up next. I see it as a way to um, get together with all my family and friends. Just a way to connect with the community. It's a way to celebrate the freedom of all the blacks, the peace between black and whites, all that. Welcome back. You can't talk about black excellence without discussing the challenges Milwaukee's black community has had to overcome. To talk about those hardships, this is Reggie Jackson. He's the head griot, head storyteller here at America's Black Holocaust Museum. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Um, we were talking a minute ago, is, is the civil rights era, people think of that as the, the 1960s. It's not. It's still alive today. There are still battles to be fought today. Absolutely. You know, people don't understand that that was the beginning of the process of having America stand up to the ideals of the Founding Father and making it something that applied to all of us mm -hmm. in a way that we had never done before. And so those efforts continue because we still see that despite the progress that we've made, we still see people that want to kind of take us back in time to an age where everyone didn't have the right to vote. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that people understand that the efforts will be consistent, continual, until yeah. we see everyone have the same rights in America. When we saw the Black Rights Matter marches a couple blocks away from here two years ago, that reminded a lot of people of the other big movements we saw come out of Milwaukee, the uh, housing marches, the school desegregation movement. The, Milwaukee is steeped in this. Milwaukee is absolutely steeped in that, and I think one of the most important things to understand about what we saw with the Black Lives Matter movement, marches and protests, and what we saw in the open housing campaign, the desegregation campaign that Milwaukee was leading, it was young people. Mm -hmm. Young people have always been on the forefront of that. NAACP Youth Council, you know, were the ones who were marching across the 16th Street Viaduct. Young people were actively involved, and that's something I think we need to, to do more. Teach the young, young people that you were actively involved in this, and we talk about Father Grappi and Vale Phillips and all these famous people, but let's, let's focus more of the attention on the power that young people in our communities have, and they've shown us that the last couple of years as well. Our last minute here, this is 5,000 square feet, 500 years of history. What do you want people to carry with them when they leave this place? Well, I want them to leave with the spirit of Dr. Cameron, the founder of the museum. A man who survived a lynching at the age of 16, survived being forced to witness a lynching at the age of eight, but had no hatred in his heart. A man who wanted America, in his words, to become a nation that was full of people that were one single and sacred nationality. He wanted us all to come together to make America live up to the ideals of the Founding Fathers. He said the Founding Fathers were brilliant, except that what they created didn't apply to everyone. So what we want people to do is to walk through that history, understanding how these things have not applied to African Americans so that we know how we got to where we are today and as we move forward and we make the progress towards race repair and reconciliation we have the tools necessary the historical knowledge the context of the journey that we have ahead of us because the movement hasn't stopped Reggie Jackson thank you so much for your time this afternoon we'll be right back it doesn't matter if everybody is a different is a different is a different color it just means that you're supposed to be treated the same way as other than treated Welcome back. Throughout Milwaukee, you can find pieces of black history expressed as art, like this one. It's at the corner of 28th and Bleat. It shows black athletes in Wisconsin who have gone above and beyond, like Giannis, Reggie White, and of course, Hank Aaron. A Milwaukee woman is making learning black history accessible to everybody, something she hopes schools will use one day. Sarah McGrew gives us a look at an app she's developed. 
Like many moms, Deborah Blank strived to make sure she provided her son with a good life. Part of having a good life for an African American is having pride in who you are and, and where you come from. So she started working on a black history textbook, which eventually turned into a set of questions her son studied and she would quiz him on. She saw his excitement in learning that way and wanted to share it. You can't just do something for your own child if you're not willing to at times make sure that other children, other families have that same opportunity. She and her son eventually teamed up to create the Blackstory app. Launched last year, the app quizzes you not only on historical figures and movements, but on people making history today. You can scan the QR code on your screen to download it. Well, when they go in the app, they'll find uh, a lot of questions broken down into 10 categories from Africa to the diaspora to quotations, um, inventions, uh, individual achievements. You can play to learn or turn it into more of a competition with timed and scored versions. Eventually, she hopes teachers will be able to use it to teach black history in schools. Teachers may be interested but not know how to or not have the time to figure out how does this work in my in my class with my curriculum. And she's also hoping to one day have an African American History Bowl. I want to incentivize the idea of learning, so I want people to compete and actually go through a learning bowl where they can compete for prizes. Reporting in Milwaukee, Sarah McGrew, TMJ4 News. Deborah guarantees if you just spend five minutes every morning on that app, you will learn something new about black history. We'll be right back. Black History Month means to me is like a month to honor black history, respect, and for like black people to be like dignity in themselves. Welcome back one last time. Again, America's Black Holocaust Museum will open tomorrow. It's open to the public at 10 a.m. They'll have a ribbon cutting and opening ceremony at nine, remarks from local leaders. Tomorrow, admission is free thanks to a generous donation from Herb Cole Philanthropies. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Milwaukee Tonight. The conversation continues online at tmj4.com slash black history. We will see you once again on the News at 10.